there are some books that are really foundational in the sense that they kind of tie everything together, or it's what might be called like a hub, like uh, you know that that all the other books of scripture plug into, and um, <clears throat> and Deuteronomy is one of those books. It's the it's a book that uh, the rest of the Bible uh, will build on in a sense <clears throat> because it really provides those concepts, definitions, ideas patterns that will uh, come out in the rest of uh, the Old Testament, uh, the rest of the New Testament. It will define what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. It will define what it means to uh, be in the New Covenant with a heart that uh, can actually love God and obey God and desires those things. And so, and it also defines, you, you need to know this book going forward um, because it, it will make sense of the rest of um, Old Testament survey one and two. Because there will be things that will happen to Israel that the prophets will show up and warn them about, and they will warn them using the language and the writing of Deuteronomy. So, for example, if there's no rain on the land, or there's a locust plague, or there's enemies are attacking them and they're, they're not having victory in battle, and they start warning them of exile, they're going to use the curses of Deuteronomy to say, here's what's going to happen, here's what you're experiencing, and here's how it's going to get worse if you don't continue uh, or if you don't turn and obey God. Okay? Um, it also defines books like uh, the book of Judges. So Deuteronomy says in uh, the book, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, Vivian, can you stop clicking that thing? Yes, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses says, You shall not do what we are all doing here today, everyone doing what is right in his own eyes. Do you get, what biblical book do you know that that sounds like, that that gets repeated a couple times in another biblical book we'll get to, hopefully in the next couple weeks, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You guys remember this? Which book talks about this where the people sin, God raises up a judge, then they sin again. Judges, yeah. So when you hear in the book of Judges, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, it's like, okay, that's, that's bad. But you know that it's extra bad because Moses said, don't do that. And then when you start seeing that happen, you're like, oh, this is going to be a problem. It'll also define a book like Ruth. <clears throat> Ruth happens during the time of the Judges, and uh, this family leaves Israel because there's a famine on the land. Well, there's a famine on the land because, because of, uh, of disobedience, and that's one of the curses of the law. And then they go and they marry uh, the, this father, mother, and sons. The two sons marry these women, uh, foreign women from among the Moabites, <clears throat> one of them being Ruth. <clears throat> and then all the men die, and Ruth and her mother-in-law go back to the land. Um, and then Ruth starts, uh, because she and her mother-in-law are poor, they're widows, <clears throat> they start, Ruth goes and gleans in the field, meaning some of the workers in the field, um, instead of pulling all the grain and the grapes and everything off of the tree, would not pull them off fully, but leave a little bit of grain for, so that poor people could come through and collect for themselves, like widows and orphans and things like this. Well, that's a law from Deuteronomy. And then Ruth um, is in Boaz's field, and he wants to marry her uh, because he is, uh, well, he loves her, but also because uh, he, her first husband who died is a close relative of Boaz. Well, that's Leverite marriage. That's defined by Deuteronomy, where you raise up uh, seed for your dead brother or dead relative so that they would have a continuing name in Israel. So you, you don't really understand um, the rest of the Bible in that sense unless you get this book. Uh, remember, this is also the book that Jesus says the greatest commandment uh, comes from the Deuteronomy. The core of the law is what? <clears throat> What's the greatest commandment? Love thy neighbor, or to love God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Yeah, and then the second is love your neighbor as yourself, right? So that comes from Deuteronomy and then from Exodus, uh, respectively. Then Jesus, when he's in the wilderness, quotes Deuteronomy three times as he's tempted uh, by the devil, right? So this is a key uh, book in that sense. And when the prophets show up to confront Israel or confront the kings, 
they will act as God's lawyers. Well, that sounds kind of weird, but they, they engage in what's called a covenant lawsuit. So when like Jeremiah or Isaiah or Amos uh, or Hosea, uh, they show up and they give warnings, they're going to use the language of Deuteronomy to warn the people and say, I'm showing up here today to show you that you are in violation of God's law and God's covenant, and therefore I'm suing you on behalf of God to say, here's the results for disobedience, and you need to repent. And so that's what the prophets will, uh, will do. So this book, if you get it, you can really understand in a large way the rest of the Bible. Okay, And so... Let's talk about just what the book is, okay? The, the name that comes down to us, which is actually a pretty good one, um, is, is Deuteronomy, okay? But it comes from the compound of two uh, Greek words. It said this in the video, but do you guys know what deutero means when something's uh, deutero or what that word implies? <clears throat> Was it like a... Said in the video, but it's okay if you don't know, that's why we're going over. An explanation? Uh, no, that is what he's going to do, that's true, but it's, um, it's not an explanation the first time, it's an explanation what? The second, the second, second time. Sec Deuteronomy, Deutero means second, or next, uh, or kind of, sometimes it can mean lesser, but not in this sense. And then namas is uh, law. Right. So that's the idea is this is the second giving of the law. This is the, the kind of renewed or the, the giving again of the covenant. And so Moses is, that's why I put here the second giving of the law slash covenant. Um, that Moses is reaffirming with the, the next generation that's going to go into the land. And then key point here, why does Moses feel the need to give this um, kind of Bible conference on the law, give these series of sermons on the law and uh, about going into the land and laying out all the definitions for going forward. Why does Moses feel the need to, to do this, to send them into the land with the book of Deuteronomy? What's the issue? Yeah. Well, he says that, oh, in the video it says that they're going to rebel at one point and then they're going to forget the word he dies. Right, they, they are, yeah. And then um, what's going to, you're right, he's, they are going to rebel. They are going to forget the Lord um, when Moses dies. Uh, Hudson, what else were you going to say? I was going to say that. Okay, but Moses is not what? As far as they're going to the land, but Moses, what? He's not going with them. He's going to die outside the land, okay? And uh, so Moses' sin prevents him from going into the land too. So what he sends them in with is the book of Deuteronomy. And so it lays out, okay, yes, uh, just like Timmy pointed out, uh, that he says, I'm not, I know you're not going to obey uh, in that sense. So he, he, ex he says that largely that will be your destiny, but from there God will restore you, which is, the, the question is how? Okay? And we get a glimpse into how in Deuteronomy chapter 30, but the rest of the Bible has to uh, really elaborate on this and, and bring this to uh, a point of, okay, how does this uh, actually work? Okay? Uh, so Deuteronomy also, uh, the Hebrew name, uh, Deuteronomy 1.1, 1, 1, says, These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. So it's really just... Moses spoke, Moses preached. Second giving of the law is an appropriate name, but this is now Moses' sermon series on the law. And something for you to understand that will be uh, kind of helpful, I think, in our Western uh, American mindset is Deuteronomy is a constitution. It's something that lays out the laws, the definitions, the ideas uh, for Israel. It's a constitutional uh, law that, that provides the foundation for Israel's uh, identity and law system relative to God and the covenant relative to God. And notice in Deuteronomy 1.1, 1, 1, it also talks about Moses spoke these words in the wilderness. So there's this idea left over from Numbers, which is keeps repeating, in the wilderness, in the wilderness, in the wilderness, that they're even going to die in the wilderness, right? So... Um, 
So I put here that uh, Deuteronomy provides key definitions, concepts, paradigms, right? Um, one of them that, that I like to talk about is also the, uh, the paradigm of it provides the law for God-cursed leadership, how they're supposed to die. They don't get stoned to death with stones, they get hung up on a tree. Well, Paul and Peter and John, they will take that language and that idea from Deuteronomy and say, okay, when Jesus dies on the cross, he's taking on God's curse, and this is also what Isaiah, uh, and Isaiah 53, Zechariah, Zechariah 12, and uh, David in Psalm 22, will use that paradigm to understand that the Messiah will die a God-cursed death, not because he himself is cursed, but because he'll bear the wrath of God for his people. Well, Deuteronomy lays that principle out, that paradigm out, so that when Jesus dies on the cross, it's not just like, oh, some guy in the past, Jesus of Nazareth, died on, by Roman crucifixion. Lots of people died by Roman crucifixion, but that he was actually uh, doing a redemptive death as a leader for sin. Okay, so, uh, key words in the book, uh, hear, okay, the word hear or listen, as we translate in, Israel, uh, in uh, English, but there's the hear, O Israel statement over and over and over again where Moses will call them to attention, say, okay, this is kind of where he says, the, the, listen up, okay? And you can kind of trace like Moses' different statements or, or uh, sections somewhat by here, by him saying here. Now in English, we can uh, distinguish between these two words, okay? <clears throat> where we say hearing is like, the entering of sound physically into your ears. Like everybody's hearing me, but not everybody necessarily is, is listening. Like, right, have you ever um, had someone hear what you said, but they didn't listen, they didn't really get what you said, or they didn't fully understand and respond uh, to what you said, but you know that the data, the information uh, entered into their ears, right? Um, what's always kind of funny to me um, as a teacher is like I would like with junior high I would get up in the, uh, and talk about some project or something that we were going to do and then I would have them start working on it and the instructions would be you know on Google Classroom they'd start working on it and then immediately everybody would ask me to re-explain um, everything that I had just explained. So I eventually quit doing that because what I realized was um, they didn't listen until it was relevant for them. So, uh, so I would like say, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to start with this, you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. And then the kid gets it and he's like, well, what was this? Or, you know, I, I said the other day, not, I don't remember if it's this, I don't think it was this class, but I um, wrote up a bunch of notes on the board and we were talking about, like, in the whole class, this is, okay, here's what you're going to want to put in your paper. This is the review for Leviticus. This is for your Leviticus paper. You, here's all the key verses. Here's the key concepts. You guys remember that lecture. But somebody from another class asks at the end of class, which was fine. It's good to clarify, but it was just kind of funny. It was like, can we use this stuff on our paper? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm putting it on the board. Uh, so I was glad that the question got asked, but it's kind of one of those things of like hearing versus uh, listening. And so in this sense, um, and this is what James picks up on in uh, James 1, the Hebrew concept of hearing, where James talks about not just to be a, a forgetful hearer of the word, but to be a what? Doer of the word, yeah. Because he says the, the evidence that you heard and actually understood, because uh, it's easy to say, yeah, I heard God, I listened to God, I love God, but the evidence comes out in action. And that's the only thing that you can see. Because anybody can say, well, yeah, I heard this, but you can only see it through, through their action. So uh, Moses is going to call the people to, uh, to listen up, to pay attention. Um, and the key... Uh, verse, arguably, of Deuteronomy uh, is Deuteronomy 6, where it gives them the, the prayer, the main statement of faith of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and then he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. 
So your whole being is supposed to uh, love God. Okay, so that is another key term, the idea of love slash remember. Okay, so how do we love God? How does it? How do we show uh, that we love God? That's what uh, Deuteronomy six actually lays out. Here's how you act toward God if you love Him. Here's how you act toward God if you hate Him. And so he says that part of the idea of love in the scriptures is remembering. Okay, now it doesn't mean you just don't forget. It means that you hold in the focus of your heart and mind something that you're prioritizing, something that you care the most about. So when he says you shall remember the Lord, but then he'll also warn them, when you get into the land, <clears throat> don't think you brought this about for yourself and forget God. Okay? So a lot of times the problem is not just that people turn away from God and say, okay, I hate God, I'm not going to follow him anymore. It's that they drift and forget about God even when they receive uh, God's goodness. Okay? So love and remember will be a key, uh, key words as well. Okay, so kind of just on the right over here to give an outline just of the book. The book's broken down um, as what's called a, a covenant treaty, which was a document type of the time, which basically the king would provide uh, the king would provide bless uh, would provide a prologue, history, and then laws. And then would say, okay, here's the blessings for keeping the laws, here's the curses for disobeying the laws, and then a kind of summary, okay, and a, and a written document that everybody would, would be accountable to. Um, <clears throat> and so this is kind of how Deuteronomy breaks down, if you want kind of a basic overview of the book. Uh, in 1 through 3, Moses is going to give kind of some writing and sermon on basically here's the history of where we've been to where we are today and why we're here. Why we're still, um, can that noise stop, please? Uh, where we're still in the wilderness um, and why, uh, why this previous generation has died in the wilderness and why, Mo <clears throat> why Moses is going to die in the wilderness as well. And Moses will, will be transparent about that, but he's gonna give them a kind of a review of what happened through that time. Then chapters 4 through 11 are really kind of Moses' set of sermons. It's in chapter 4 where you start to get here, and he, he reminds them that God is a jealous God. He reminds them of certain things about God. And then you get Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is the review of the Ten Commandments, okay, where he says, okay, here's the summary of the law. And then you get ch uh, chapter 6, which is about 6 to 7, is about loving God uh, with all your heart and what that means, what that looks like. Um, and then 7 continues to elaborate uh, on that theme. Chapter 8 warns them about pride. He says, when you get into this land, don't say, man, I was so great back there. I got into this land because I'm awesome, and I built all this for myself. He says, don't uh, forget God. And then in chapter 9, Moses says, also don't say to yourself it was because of my righteousness that God brought me into this land. And he's going to say over and over and over again, it was not because of God's, of your righteousness, it was because God was uh, good to you when you did not deserve it and swore uh, a covenant. And what covenant is that? Abrahamic. Abrahamic, right? So he's saying, because God is faithful to his covenant to Abraham is why you're in the land today, not because you're righteous and not because you brought it about for yourself. So, in, so if you guys want to know the difference between uh, pride and self-righteousness, Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells you what pride looks like. Deuteronomy chapter 9 tells you what self-righteousness looks like. Chapter 10, God gives them the, you need to have a circumcised heart, which is true, but they're kind of not able to do that. And we're going to see that as being a problem later. Not a problem for God, but a problem for them and what they understand at that time. And then uh, Deuteronomy 11, God lays out, okay, here's the tablets rewritten. Here's the, the accountability that you and I are all accountable to this law before God. And then here is chapters 12 through 26, where he's going to take the commands of God, take the Ten Commandments, and apply them to specific circumstances that give principles for how they're supposed to work out the commands. So, for example... 
Commandment number eight. You guys remember what commandment number eight is? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Very good. Okay. So he applies commandment number eight in Deuteronomy, in the set of laws, to situations like this. Let's say your neighbor's um, ox or animal is walking out in a field, just wandering around by itself, and you see it, and it's not in your neighbor's property. Is it okay for you to just, according to the law in this time and everything, is it okay for you just to say, not my problem, and, and move on? What do you guys think? No. The law says that what you're supposed to do is to take it and try to return it to your neighbor. But if your neighbor's too far away, what do you do? Take it. Take it forever? Take yeah. it until your neighbor comes back. Take it until your neighbor comes back, yeah. Because you're not supposed to have your neighbor's property in your hand, but you can bring it to your home, uh, not use it, and, and return it to your neighbor. So that's an application of you shall not steal, okay? An application of um, you shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment is worship God at these appointed times at Jerusalem. What's well, like, well, wait a second. Well, it doesn't say Jerusalem. He says that at the place God will choose. Okay, well, how does that show the one God? Well, one God, one place of worship. Right? So there are things like that that will be ironed out in these uh, commands that Moses is going to give you uh, principles for. And it's not always obvious. Sometimes it takes a little bit of like work and careful thinking to understand what they're, um, what they're getting at here. But uh, Jesus, Paul, uh, Peter, John, they will quote Deuteronomy to apply certain uh, thinking and principles to the church. Paul quotes Deuteronomy to talk about um, why people should pay their, uh, their pastors who, and missionaries who work and, make a, and you know, give their lives to doing the job of uh, pastoring or shepherding or being an elder. Okay? Uh, do you know what law that, um, that they use to talk about, that Paul uses to talk about that you should pay somebody, that, that a man that's given his life to the ministry and is doing that for your church, why you should pay that person? What law does, uh, do you guys know what law he refers to? He does refer to a Deuteronomy law. He says, he refers to a law that says... Uh, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And it's this law where this ox is walking around on this, uh, on this uh, grain that crushes the grain and allows the grain to be separated, the wheat to be separated from the chaff. But what the law says is that you don't put a muzzle that blocks the mouth of the ox while he's walking around doing that work. You take the muzzle off so that as the ox is working, he can eat. Okay. So Moses, uh, not Moses, Paul takes that command from Moses and says, look, if this is a command from the law that we even have for animals, that you allow them to eat while they're working, then for pastors and elders who rule well, you should give them double honor. They should uh, be able to make a living as well, and so you should provide for them. So they, Paul uses those uh, principles. You also have heard... Um, the idea of uh, bringing something up on the testimony of two or three witnesses, right? Not a single witness just gets to accuse somebody with no evidence. That there needs to be a, a uh, evidence and uh, multiple uh, witnesses to condemn someone. So there, that's brought into the church as well, right? So, uh, so relevant things from the commands of, uh, of God in this sense. Okay, so he reviews the history, and then the exposition of the commands, and then in chapters 27 and 28, they go over the blessings and the curses. Okay, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience, and then Moses spends most of his time talking about the curses. Uh, why? Why does he feel the need to spend more time talking about the curses for disobedience rather than the blessings for obedience? Because he knows they're going to disobey. Yeah, because he knows, and he tells them, I know you're going to disobey. And so he spends more time talking about those consequences because this is mostly going to be their reality. They'll get some of this. They'll get to see the potential. But mostly Moses says this is basically going to be your destiny, is curses. 
But that's going to create a big problem because how can they, hey guys, stop talking a long time, please. How can they be a blessing to all the nations and all the families of the earth if they are stuck under curse? That's going to be a big problem. And that's where you get Deuteronomy chapter 29. Okay? This Deuteronomy chapter 29, not for Moses, but for the people, is where Moses gives, I don't know if this is the right way to say this, but gives them kind of an annoying sermon. It's a sermon that raises questions that he doesn't answer yet. And he says, okay, here's, here's three big problems. He goes, problem number one is, is God's been faithful to you, given you his law. The law is not unreasonable, and God's done his side, and you're supposed to love God with your whole heart, but God hasn't given you a heart to love God, and the law doesn't provide it. That's problem number one. Okay? So that's a tension. It's a dilemma. God knows how he's going to solve it, but the people are like, well, wait a second. How can we make this thing happen if we don't have the heart to do it? Okay? Tension number two is the tension of the group versus the individuals. Okay? Guys, you're being kind of distracting this morning, so can we not take 20, every 20 seconds looking at the screen or dropping things or talking? It's, it's distracting me. Um, it talks about tension between the individual and the group. Okay, so here's a, a perfect example of this I, that I thought about last week. Um, you guys know the reality of that when there's a group, individuals can ruin something for everybody. Right? You guys know that, right? You've experienced that, right? And you can also, you can be part of a group where you're not necessarily doing anything bad, but the kind of overall issues with the group affect you. You guys probably experienced this as well. So let me give an example. Um, in chapel, you know when we set up, cha uh, put away chairs at the end, okay? That's kind of a frustrating process. Uh, and why is that an, uh, a frustrating process to put away the chairs? What starts to happen as more and more people start to stack them and you're supposed to stack them in a certain way? What starts to be the result? His junior has put them up upside down. Okay, right. They get put on. Somebody, some in, it, all it takes is one individual to come about, put the chair on there the wrong way, upside down, or just not have it lock on totally, right? You guys, I've seen this, you guys have seen this. The one individual brings kind of a guilt on the whole group. Now imagine if you're the next person, you either have to reset the chair or set your chair on it incorrectly as well. But also, let's say you're somebody who sets it up correctly every time. But all of us got talked to last week by Dr. Wilson saying, hey guys, really be careful one by one to stack those chairs, right? So it's like the individuals bring down the group and sometimes the group brings down the individuals. And that's how Israel's sin is going to be. You're going to have people who are going to sin that's going to permeate throughout the group. But you're also going to have the group have consequences for the people who do follow God. Like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, like Daniel. They follow God, but they're going to go into exile too. right? So that's a problem. It's like, how can you, how can you solve this? And then the next problem is, which I already mentioned, is Israel's supposed to be a blessing to all the nations. Okay? God's going to be faithful either way and curse them for disobedience or bless them for obedience. If they're cursed, they eventually, what's the big curse? What's the big one that happens to them? They get kicked. What? Out of Israel. Get kicked out of Israel. They get kicked out of the land. And so the question is, Wait a second, how can you be a blessing if you are stuck under curse? And then Moses says at the end here in Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. So it's like, well, wait a second, Moses, you haven't solved the problem. You have just said the secret things belong to the Lord. But he says, but the things revealed belong to us, meaning we have more. We don't ask God about what his, his secret sovereign will is. We go by what he has revealed. But Deuteronomy 30 uh, starts to answer that question. So Deuteronomy 30, key text for the new covenant, for what God accomplishes um, in, in the, our era uh, as well. Okay? Then he warns them again, says, I know you're not going to obey. Okay? In Deuteronomy 31, 
And then he says, I'm going to teach you guys a song. And this is going to be the song that you remember when you get kicked out of the land and into those nations and all the curses on, of the law come on to you. You're going to remember this song about how you didn't obey, but how good God was anyway. Um, and you're going to sing this to yourself when you're experiencing those consequences. And then he gives them a blessing to all the tribes. Okay? And then Moses dies, passes on the uh, authority to Joshua, who will enter the land. So that's basically the outline of the book. But I wanted to read a couple texts from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Look at Deuteronomy 1, uh, verse 5 where he says, uh, across, uh, oh, actually, let's look at, sorry, verses 1, and, uh, 2, and 3 real quick. Uh, 1, 2 says, it is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Okay, where is Horeb? What, is, what mountain is that? You probably know it better as another name. Sinai. Sinai, okay. So that's where they receive the law, that's where they meet God, that's where they get the covenant the first time, they stay there for about a year, and then they move, okay? And how long does it take to get from Horeb, Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea on the edge of the land where they're told to go into the land? How many days, according to... 40? Uh, no, look at uh, Deuteronomy 1, 2. 11. Okay. So to get from here to here, it takes 11 days, but what gets in the way is... Numbers chapter 14, where they rebel against God and against Moses, we won't go into the land, and then God shuts off the land to them for 40 years, and that generation dies. So instead of doing, so Moses gets a kind of, uh, a little bit ironic here, or a little bit sarcastic here, where he's saying, look, this could have taken 11 days, but instead, how long did it take? 40 years. 40 years. Yeah, so they took the 40-year plan versus the 11 day plan. So now Moses is going to review their history. And I call this a history of unbelief or uh, disobedience. If you look at number, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ex Deuteronomy 132, he says, but for all this, you did not trust Yahweh your God. That's what his main uh, issue is here. And so look at Deuteronomy 1.5. This explains what Moses is doing. Okay, it says across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying, okay, what, is, uh, what does it mean to expound? Or do your translations have anything different? What does it mean when somebody expounds? Expand on? Yeah, expand. Yeah, so it's similar. Expand, that's a good word for it. Um, what else? Expound this law. What year? Or what, what verse are we on? Uh, one, five. Explain. Okay, explain. Yeah. Give uh, explanation, uh, okay? So e explaining, it's like, this is what you guys do in your papers. This is what I do when I teach this class. This is probably what your pastors do when they teach you out of the Bible, is they don't just read you John 3.16. They elaborate, they explain, they give definitions, they put it in context, they give you what it means. And so Moses is doing that with the law. He's teasing out all the aspects of the law so that they understand what it is that God is going to have them uh, to do. He, he clarifies or he elaborates. This is why your papers aren't just, uh, in, not just this class, but any class, aren't just one sentence. You don't just say, okay, here's, you know, uh, one sentence on, you know, like some book report or something, you know, for English class. Um, you, you know, all your teachers, I'm sure like Mr. Collins in English, uh, doesn't just say, okay, you can just write one sentence for your paper, right? You have to expound. You have to, to take the text and explain it. And so that's what Moses is doing. And he's going to review in chapters 1 through 3, here's our history. Our history is one of unbelief and disobedience. They didn't enter the land because they didn't trust the Lord. Now Moses uh, gets pretty upset with them, but he says, and you know what? I'm not going to enter the land either because... I disobeyed God. Now Moses kind of gets, you know, we'll see this, but he kind of gets, he says, it was because of you guys that I disobeyed God. Because you guys were so rebellious, I got swept up in it too. So he not blames them, but he, he's very transparent about the fact that, you know what, I'm going to be part of the generation who doesn't go in either. So what Moses sends in with them, since he's not going to be with them, is what? What does Moses leave behind? since they won't have his presence. 
What is he giving them? Law. Give them law. Yeah, they, they have the book of Deuteronomy. They'll have the whole Pentateuch, but they'll have the book of Deuteronomy to be the replacement, in a sense, of God's word through Moses, even though they won't have uh, Moses himself. So, okay, next time we'll get a little bit more into these, uh, these details of how the book uh, works. Um, but basically, that's kind of the overview of, of what this book does and kind of how it contributes to the rest of the Bible. And it's too bad we kind of have only four days to, uh, to get into this, but we don't mind having, I'm sure you guys don't mind having a three-day weekend. So, um, so anyway, um, we will end.